Our next speaker is Elizabeth Davey. She's coming to us from southeastern Idaho, and she is here to give us a forest restoration perspective from a district ranger's chair. Good morning. Um, as you can see from my slide, I'm definitely a district ranger. I am a bureaucrat. There's no doubt about it. I've worked for the Forest Service for close to 30 years. I have green in my blood. Um, but I'm also a forest ecologist. That's my passion and what I've uh, done for training. I'm a silviculturist. Um, so hopefully, I functioned as a specialist for a long time, and I spoke for the trees and the ecosystem that the trees were involved in, and it just seemed so simple. And now that I'm a manager, I'm not a leader, I'm a manager, I have, I, when I was a, a specialist, I acted on the current research, and I you know, kept my landscapes, tried to make them resilient to perturbations and mimic mother nature and things like that. But now that I'm a manager of all those resources, it's just really complicated, because there's people involved. <laughs> I did not get people training, which y'all need people training. So I'm going to discuss the various challenges that I've faced uh, recently in my seven-year tenure as a ranger, what I've experienced, and maybe some of the things that we've tried to work through um, to make it happen. And hopefully we can all learn something from it and have a little bit of a discussion about it. Whoa. So some of the challenges, um, old forest plans. Here in the Intermountain region, I think all the forests, or virtually all the forests, we have old forest plans from the 80s and 90s. Those um, also uh, single species management uh, connected to the Endangered Species Act. The public perception of an ecosystem or a landscape. Um, Competing interests, not only from the public, but from folks within our organizations, our agencies. Our forest plans for the Forest Service are, are the documents. We have lots of direction in forest plans and other documents that guide us. And so I'm going to try to talk a little bit about that. But that's how we have to manage our public lands. So forest plans, um, they are our guiding light. And they're old. But we have to continue to follow them because if we don't, we break the law. And you got to decide if you want to take that risk or not and what part of that risk you want to take. Most, right now, most of our forest plans, they focus on commodity production. They focus on timber, grazing, recreation. They don't really focus on restoration. There's wording in there that you can kind of find and play with. The science is old. Climate change is not mentioned. Um, and right now, a lot of our public lands are, are recovering from large disturbances like bark beetle epidemics, um, really huge wildfires, and past management practices. That lower left-hand corner happens to be my district uh, in the 1970s. That straight line there, that's Yellowstone National Park. It's an island park. We did a whole bunch of clear-cutting of lodgepole pine. I'm living with that right now. Was it good, bad? I don't know, but I'm living with it. So the plans really that we work with and that we have to f comply and follow, they don't deal with the work that we need to do now at a restoration scale on that, that great big large scale. Some of the things that we're working on right now, at least on the Caribou Targhee and the Targhee portion of that, and places that I've been elsewhere, the Bridger Teton, the Salmon Chalice, yes, we can revise and amend our forest plans. But in this region, anyways, three get to go at a time. There's like 13 national forests that probably need to do this. So three are amending, um, or revising, I should say. Um, so we've amended our plans. We've amended it with lynx amendments, grizzly bear amendments, sage grouse amendments, as an example. And we've even done some very site-specific amendments to those plans like on a project basis, because there was just something we couldn't live with in that plan that could still lead us to restoration. We've been um, writing white papers, if I could use that term, to interpret some of the things in our forest plans that we just didn't know how it was meant to be, like old growth. Um, both the caribou and the Targhee plan, we're working on interpreting what did we mean by old growth in 1997. Now it's 2017. So we're working with that to try and interpret what the forest plan meant. For lynx, we're trying to get an amendment through right now on the Targhee to amend our lynx analysis units to comply with better science that we have, um, to define the lynx habitat and how those standards and guides in our plans can be implemented. 
Sometimes landscape analysis can help us at a smaller scale of a, you know, rather than a forest, we're looking at just a watershed or a portion of it, a mountain range, something like that. That can sometimes help us with um, lack of information in our forest plans. All of this is extremely time consuming. It can end in litigation. I heard that lovely word not too long ago. And that can put a stop to projects that you're doing, really good, well-planned projects that you're doing. And it is expensive. Um, and it's not always a comprehensive look at an area. It might just be a smaller portion of that area, but not across the whole national forest. Um, so hopefully we can get around to amending plans, but hopefully some of these little intermediary steps can help us with that. So single species management in the Endangered Species Act. I have absolutely nothing against the Endangered Species Act. It's one of the most important acts of legislation that we have and that we've been using to guide all of our work. I do, however, am very opinionated about single species management. Um, where I come from, we have a lot of grizzly bears. Yes, they were delisted in the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, but we're still living by single species management. Lynx is the one that's got me all wrapped up. That's the one that I've been struggling with since the Lynx Amendment came out. Um, I don't have any links on my district. There was one cited there like, I don't know, 50 years ago or something. It was traveling. It did not hang out. It did not den. It did not make a home there. But I got links. That's OK. I'll, I'll you know, comply with what the amendment says and what our standards say. But some of the things that we can and can't do because of that single species management, does that affect the whole entire ecosystem and everything that's in that landscape? Well, I'd probably say yes. So also single species management in my world, I included humans in that, and I talked a little bit about people earlier. Yes, we manage some places solely for human interaction. It's called recreation. It's a huge industry now. It's a huge part of how we're managing our national forests, and I dare say how we're managing our ecosystems. Does that have conflict with those natural occurrences out there? Mm, you bet it does. So are there solutions? Maybe. I think I'm brilliant, and I came up with one. Um, in the single species management, like in the case of lynx, we took all the data and information from lynx from studies that were done in Montana. It may not necessarily apply to what's going on in southeastern Idaho. I have a totally different landscape, totally different place. You guys are all scientists. You know that. Um, can we take that science that the folks who know all about lynx and their habitats and how they function, can we take that science and then apply it on a local or more regional or landscape basis? Can I apply it just to my area? Yes. Takes a lot of time, takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of money, and I bet that trust is not out there that the agency will do that and apply it in, in a, a timely fashion. But I think it can be done. So one of the key species that we're trying to maintain on our forest is aspen. Huge talks about aspen and how it interacts on our landscape. There's an issue there, though, with lynx habitat. Lynx rely on aspen. It's one of their key um, habitat types because snowshoe hares hang out there. But as you can see in that upper left-hand corner, where aspen is associated with subalpine fir habitats, there is a standard in the lynx plan that says, it's called Veg Standard 6, no vegetation management projects that reduce snowshoe hare habitat in multi-storied, mature, or late successional forests. So there's a subalpine fir habitat in there with aspen in the overstory. Y'all are scientists, y'all are foresters, most of you are. You know what's going to happen. The subalpine fir is going to eventually outcompete the aspen. I can't treat that because it's lynx habitat, and it's a standard, and I can't treat it all across lynx habitat where there's subalpine fir. When I worked on the Bridge of Teton, the whole forest was covered with that. As you all know, there's other species, elk. Anybody hear of elk? Oh, what season is this? October, hunting season. Elk use that kind of habitat and aspen all the time. Pretty soon, we aren't going to have that on the landscape anymore. Um, we've already noticed reductions in aspen on our landscape. We've already talked about how important aspen is on the landscape. My hands are tied, I can't treat it if it's in that kind of habitat. I suggest that you take a landscape, however you decide to define that landscape, and as a solution, you decide how much of that habitat is critical for 
whatever species you're talking about. Here I'm talking about lynx, but whatever species, and you manage for that, and you manage the rest of that landscape for the other species, because it's all part of it. They all coexisted at one time. We've got to be able to manage for more than one species. I mean, Aspen's disappearing for a whole variety of reasons, and yet we're prevented from doing anything with it in certain cases. Oh, there it is, my favorite species, whitebark pine. Um, whitebark pine and grizzly bears. It's a critical source, food source for grizzly bears. At one time, whitebark pine was proposed to be listed as a um, teeny species. Grizzly bears in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem were just delisted, um, but these, these two species coexist. So if they ever become listed again, which one's gonna take precedence? We all know in the Endangered Species Act, when something is listed, you often are not allowed to touch it. You're not allowed to manage habitat. It seems like the Endangered Species Act was created for animals. Plants are a different beast, dare I say. Um, I don't know how we would do that, because a lot of times you're not allowed to cut it, burn it, destroy it, kill it. But we all know whitebark pine survives on disturbance that being able to, to uh, seed in or, or keep itself on the landscape. So how are we going to work through that? <clears throat> well, some brilliant people in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, oh, happened to be one of them, uh, created this um, strategy, the whitebark pine strategy. We looked at the whole entire ecosystem where whitebark pine existed, and we developed a long-term plan of how we're going to manage whitebark pine not only for grizzly bears, but for everything else they provide, whitebark pine um, ecosystems provide. It happens to be a keystone species. Maybe that's part of the answer is we manage for these keystone species and then everything else will be happy that um, relies on it. I don't know, I'm kind of naive sometimes about those things. Um, but develop that long-term plan. It takes incredibly dedicated people who want to do that. It's a lot of work, it's a lot of effort, it's a lot of fun. And it takes partners to do it. We did it with a whole bunch of different people that not only contributed money, but they also contributed um, their knowledge and their, their ability to do things on the ground. Let's just manage for the whole. Sounds pretty simple. We've talked about wildfire on and off all morning. Um, is it good or bad? The Forest Service has done a really good job on confusing the heck out of the public about whether it's good or bad. <laughs> We had let it burn policies. Oh wait, that was the NPS policy. We had, we had let it burn, we had fire use, we had fire use for resource benefit, and now we just have wildfire or prescribed burns. But there's huge, huge resistance, and it's our fault from the public to not immediately stomp out that fire. They don't care how it was started, where it is, what it's doing, they want that fire out. Smokey Bear was one of our most effective campaigns ever and still doing a great job. You all know what he says, right? Only you can prevent forest fires. Every kid from this height up, well, maybe not every kid, need to educate y'all a little more, um, knows what Smokey says. They want Smokey to be at all their events. They want Smokey to show up and give out Easter eggs, all that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> Smokey's really, really good. Maybe one of the solutions is we need to have Smokey give a different message. And since I'm a Forest Service employee, I'm not allowed to say what Smokey should say. But use your imagination, because that's, you know, it's not kosher to say something other than what Smokey's supposed to say. So managers know that we're never going to thin, cut, whatever you want to call it, our way out of some of this restoration work that we need to do. It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of money, and we do only a few hundred acres at a time. Um, some of our excuse me, vegetation types that we want to restore, they're fire dependent. I live in an extremely fire dependent landscape. Lodgepole pine, subalpine fir, aspen, whitebark pine. Um, it, it needs fire and we all know that. Everyone has those kinds of species or that kind of landscape that they're dealing with. So I keep saying fire's the answer. It's cheaper most of the time um, and it's, it's effective. It's also scary. It's also risky, and it's not very well accepted by the publics or even by folks inside our agencies. It's not very well accepted, because maybe it's not very well understood. Um, so prescribed fire, uh, we had a few folks talk about it, saying 
it's a risk to put prescribed fire on the ground. You're, you're very liable. I, as a line officer, am extremely liable for what those firefighters do out there. But it's still something that we need to, to work on. <clears throat> How do we educate folks? How do we get them familiar or comfortable with fire? Maybe doing it in small portions or working with private landowners or other people who get to do what they want on their own land. So up in Island Park, we're working with the Flat Ranch, which is owned by the Nature Conservancy, to conduct small units, 19 of them, across 4,000 acres of prescribed burning. It's a great experience. The public can show up. We've got a sign, public welcome. Sit on the deck, overlooking this beautiful, beautiful spot, uh, overlooking the Yellowstone Plateau, and you can watch them burn while a fire expert stands on the deck and points and roasts hot dogs and talks about what's going on out there. People aren't intimidated. Yeah, there's smoke, but it's not like these big roaring flames coming up and people are going, oh my gosh, you know, we're all going to die. It's been a great opportunity for folks to see how fire works on the landscape. This year, um, we need to keep informing the public and talking to them about it. And this year, I worked with an incident commander. He was from Alaska. And uh, one morning at the morning briefing, he introduced the day as saying, we have good fire and we have bad fire. And he's talking to firefighters. Good fire and bad fire. The bad fire is that stuff that's threatening the community. We don't want Mackenzie Bridge to burn down. The good fire is that stuff right there in the Roni fire right there that's burning into the wilderness. It's doing great things. It's doing what fire should do on the landscape. We're going to actively suppress the bad fire, and we're going to let the good fire do its thing. Everybody got it. He said the same thing in a community meeting, and people nodded their heads. You could see the lights go on. Good fire, bad fire. I don't know. Maybe it's worth it to try and relate to folks that way. Is this a solution to talking about wildfire and using fire on the landscape? Treating those wildland urban interfaces, the WUI? It's kind of a new concept for the Forest Service. Been around since the early 2000s. We're all working on projects in WUI. We chase the money, but that's also where the public is interested in, in getting some help. Um, and we got a lot of development that's up against public lands, where we have a forested landscape that's susceptible to fire. Some of the projects we've been working on in uh, the Island Park and Ashton area are just developing evacuation plans. How can we get people safely out of the area, as well as get firefighters uh, safely into the area? It's just simple. How can you leave? When are you going to leave? And do you feel safe doing it? Of course, some of them are traditional fuels reduction projects, where we're removing the fuels, cutting trees, burning trees, um, changing the landscape to hopefully change that fire behavior. Anytime I go to these publics um, and talk about the landscape or the ecosystem, I get a really funky look. I get it. You know, they're really concerned about their world, their life, what's going on there. The concerns I have are, are these things ecologically sound? Are we just buying time for just the next couple decades and then we're going to be screwed anyways? I don't know. Can you thin lodgepole and still be effective or does it all fall down? We're experimenting. We're trying to figure it out. We're trying to promote these wildland urban interface projects as part of the whole landscape and connecting all of the acre by acre little tiny projects together. Like I said, people look at it, you know, here ecosystem or here landscape and they're like, whatever, you're a greenie, you don't know what you're talking about. Yes, I do. But we need to get folks to understand what it means for them and how it's going to work. I've been working with a lot of folks in the Fire Learning Network and the Fire and Adapted Communities. They're na uh, nature conservancy organizations funded by the federal government. They're very, very good at co-learning and teaching people and learning from folks, not just agency, but all across the board where land ownership exists that have uh, forested condition. We have the Sustainable Fire Community in Island Park. We've been in existence since 2012, and I'm not even going to tell you how many acres we've treated. It's minuscule. But... And that's what frustrates everybody, because they want to get it done. They want 1,000 acres done now. We have plans. We have communication plans. We have this big landscape plan. I don't call it that. We have this big landscape plan. And we're working towards it. It's kind of good. The other challenge is the public perception and their desires. Much of our interested publics, and even those who oppose the things we're doing, they want the landscape to remain the same. Ha. Huh. I interpret this as <laughs> be static. Well, how do you do that when we know all our landscapes, our ecosystems are dynamic? 
So some of our management goals that, we're, that we have are natural disturbances, such like mountain pine beetle or fires. We want them to play a role on the landscape. Well, how do you do that when people want it to remain the same? I'm not so sure. Um, so what I do or talk about is doing treatments now that can lead to a future landscape that people are going to be, I'll say, satisfied with. I call them kind of stealth treatments. I don't use that word landscape. I don't use the word ecosystem. But I have a whole bunch, due to that lower left-hand corner there, I have a whole bunch of lodgepole pine that's about the same age, looks the same, no difference in species. It's all lodgepole pine. Hundreds of thousands of acres of that. In another 40 years, I'm going to look like that again. Hundreds of thousands of acres of mountain pine beetle killed landscape. The public has told me they don't want that. They have manipulated it already, so we're going to start working towards not having a landscape that's dead and red everywhere. Some places, it's perfectly acceptable, whether it's by fire, it's stand replacing fire, or a mountain pine beetle. And we're using the work that John Shaw and Dr. Jim Long worked on, um, using mountain pine beetle um, stand density diagrams and objectives and working through all that and trying to create that landscape that the public's going to accept in the future because they don't want it to change. So we're doing it in places it's not in their backyard and they don't readily see, but we're working on it so that maybe we'll have this quote unquote resilient landscape. So throughout my talk, you've heard me say this and we've heard it all morning long, partners, 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 partners. We've got to get a lot of people on board. We've got to get them on board quickly. We've got to get them to understand what the public agencies and other landowners are doing and why. And we can't do that all by ourselves. The Forest Service has functioned by themselves for a very, very long time. We've got to start, and we are now, working with partners, a whole variety of partners. And they bring all kinds of good things to the table. They bring money, they bring expertise, they bring other people with them, they bring the ability to communicate to folks, and they can do a lot of things that the federal government can't do. We need to, to focus on having partners. So I no longer look at the forest for the trees. I try to consider both the social and the ecological landscape just to get at that bigger picture. But the people are the ones that at least I'm working for, and I got to try and understand what they want. Questions, comments, something? And Wayne, you can't ask me any questions, neither can Dr. Long, because then I get really intimidated. <laughs> I'm kidding, kind of. <laughs> yes? Since the forest plans are in Magna Carta, you've got to manage to your forest plans, how do we accelerate forest plan revisions? Because it's, we don't, businesses don't operate on 20-year-old business plans and then commercial forest systems. Um, the question was, because our forest plans are so ancient, how do we accelerate um, uh, revising those plans? I don't know. I mean, we keep putting a time frame on it, like the three forests in Region 4 in the Intermountain Region that are working on them now. I think they have a four-year timeline and the money runs out. Well, we had that when we revised our plan on the Targhee, and we still got money to revise it. Um, we're trying to work with um, a smaller set of data. We're trying to work with a very large collaborative group, which we all know takes a long, long time. I don't know how we accelerate that, because it all takes money. And if I'm not working out on the ground and I'm working on a forest plan, then somebody's trail doesn't get cleared, as an example. And so I don't, I don't know. Maybe there's other agency folks in here who have ideas about that, but I have absolutely no idea. Um, we've tried a variety of things, contracting it, um, hiring special dedicated teams where you lock them in a cold, dark room and not let them out. That doesn't work very well. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, but if anybody has ideas, I bet our regional office would love to hear them, as I would. Because, yeah, they are a guiding light. Yes, ma'am. Where do we go for our latest up-to-date up science and how do we incorporate that? 
Um, we're required by law to use the latest and greatest science. So when we're doing an individual um, environmental analysis or something like that, the specialists who are working on it are using the latest science. Um, so they're updating their information by that science, whether it's reading um, uh, uh, general technical reports or working with a scientist um, on something that we don't have any data on, something like that. We're also doing a lot of citizen science work um, because uh, there's folks out there who want to go out into our landscapes and collect data and collect information. We also use words like uh, the best available science that we could buy, which means none. No, I'm kidding. Um, our research stations are very, very good at, at updating our science and getting us the latest and greatest. So we use that, and we're allowed to do that. We just can't change a standard in the forest plan that says, you know, thou shalt treat or not treat around 30 acres around a great gray owl nest or something like that. We can't do that, but we can talk about all the new information we have on great gray owls. Yes. How do I handle dealing with someone who doesn't want to do something more culturally based than authority based? No, you've got the authority to do oh. stuff, but they've always done it one way. Ah. <laughs> I hate those words. <laughs> We've always done it this way. Oh. <laughs> it's a difficult thing to do because that's, of course, where you're comfortable, where you know whatever reason made you comfortable in that. I have a few times, and Wayne will laugh at this because people who know me, I am the line officer. I have made the decision. I didn't make it in the dark. I didn't make it under the covers one night with a flashlight. I made it listening and talking to everybody and hearing. You may not like what I decide, but I don't decide it in a vacuum. Um, I have said almost those exact words, and you know they're not my friends. <laughs> I hate to say it that way, but I'm, I'm paid to look out for the public lands as well as the public, and I, you know, we all strive to do that. So I've stomped my foot more than once, <laughs> which is kind of weird. Yes, sir. So in the GYE, the question is, um, it seems like stand replacing fire and clear cutting would be kind of synonymous in how you would manage that landscape. We did a darn good job um, clear cutting starting in the 1960s. A few silviculturists and I that have worked in that ecosystem have gotten together since then. When we clear cut in the 60s and 70s, and we literally clear cut everything. Um, we would clear cut 40 to 100 acres, leave 600 feet, clear cut, 40 to 100 acres, leave a 600 foot leaf strip. Well, those leaf strips all fell down, like really, duh. So we talked a lot about, you know, what, how did that ecosystem function? Should we have gone and treated this whole great big section here and left this over here to fall down and stay there and be all this dead wood and burn up in 1988 when the fires came through during Yellowstone? Yes. So. I don't think clear cutting 40 acres and leaving 600 feet and clear cutting 40, you know, that was not how nature intended it to be. We should have done some logging here and left this over here as an example. Um, that was not the science at the time. It was, and we were feeding mills and we didn't want to leave anything out there. We, you know, our job was to make money. Ah, whoa, N never mind. <laughs> it was to sell timber. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, cool. Thank you all very much.